Welcome everyone. Welcome to another book event at the uh, Penang Institute. This is in fact the ninth book launch this year at the Institute. So as you can see, we are, we are doing our bit to help uh, literature and the and book culture in, in, uh, in Penang. We will be having another one already on Sunday at 10. So there are many books being written and being launched. But well, today the book is Hindrum and the Malaysian Indian Economy, written by community. community. What did I say? Community, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Written by an old colleague of mine, Dr. Aruna Jit Kaur. It will be launched by another old colleague of mine, Dr. Uh, YB Professor Dr. P. Ramasamy. And the moderator today will be a new colleague of mine, <laughs> Dr. Musafa K. Anwar. I have not had the pleasure of working with Dr. Uh, Dr. K. An Alakan yet. Uh, he, he will be the second panelist today. Hindras has indeed, Hindra has indeed been an organized organization that has had great significance. So I will stop talking and let the experts speak about that. Welcome again, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Ramasamy. Thank you, Dr. Silverfish. 
I think, uh, in fact, she was told by her boss in Singapore, hey, you publish a book after the Hari Raya and be careful. So I was saying there's nothing to be really worry about this book on Hindra. It's very factual. It's a matter of fact. And she has done a work. And she has done some excellent work. I may not agree with some of her tentative findings or conclusions on Hindra. Uh, but certainly I think it's a credible effort on Arnaji uh, to understand because Hindra was essentially a Tamil phenomenon. Uh, I'm not sure whether she has learned the Tamil language or not. I don't know whether she actually read the Tamil papers or not. Uh, I think there's a wealth of information on the Indra movement. <coughs> I'm not saying the Tamil papers are very objective. They can be very emotive on these issues. And uh, so she uh, finally produced it and I just got the book uh, for a few weeks back. And she wanted to launch it in, uh, in Penang. I said, what better place than the Penang Institute? You are friends in Penang Institute. You are friends in the Pakistan Harappan government. So we don't consider this at all sensitive because Hindra was a phenomenon that has impacted on the lives of Indians and other Malaysians to a considerable extent. I think you must understand uh, the Hindra wave uh, before the 2008 election it impacted on how Indians shifted their political allegiance to Pakistan right then. And I think that one, you must credit Indra. There's no two ways about it. How Indian support went to DAP, PKR, Pakatan Raya. But before 2008, so large extent Indian support was still in Barisan, with the MIC and so on. So that, that very uh, a significant shift, political shift occurred after the Hindra movement. Whatever you say about the Hindra movement, whatever you say about the leaders, what has happened in the uh, post Hindra period, I think that's important. There are two, two things about Hindra. One is this shift, political shift. And you know, in 2008 elections, actually we, uh, uh, the Hindra thing was the, the battle cry in terms of getting the uh, Makkal Sakti, people's power, was a better cry to get the words of the Indians to the side of BAP and BKR and so on. And no one can actually ignore that thing. And, uh, and, and then, you know, we got the majority of Indian support in Penang. I'm not sure exactly in Sanaga, but then I think majority of Indian support went to Pakatan Raya. That actually brought Victory to Pakatana uh, Raya in Islamo, uh, Kada, Pasmalatan, where the very Indian population was very not that significant, uh, and Para. And, the, and that support has sustained us. In three, a 2013 election, the Hindra movement actually, the support among Indians in Penang significantly went down. Okay, apart from this electoral political shift. The other thing is about the impact it had on the civil service. You know, the Hindra movement arose because of a variety of factors, a combination of factors. Although some events could have precipitated the movement, especially the, 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 the destruction of temple in Klein. It's more of a catalyst. But this is really years of grievances that was building up. And it's just a matter of time before it erupted. And that thing was in, in, in 2007, November 25th, right? November 25th. Now, the other important event, impact, the Indra had was, the, you know, not, not a significant impact on employment of Indians in the civil service. You take any Indian, whether he's in the police force, whether he's in the, in the armed forces, or whether in government service, after the Indra movement, there was a significant increase of Indian employment in all these agencies. And they started taking more Indians, especially the police force. In fact, I wish to tell the very senior police officers, 
the same. The Hindra movement actually impacted positively in terms of India because I think Indians in the civil service are uh, small and far between, very insignificant. That has increased. Now, whether this has stopped or not, I'm not sure. And uh, so I think uh, I must credit Aruna for actually uh, uh, writing this book. I think she did, uh, I don't know, she interviewed a uh, number of people, even the, some of the Indra leaders, I understand. And she came out, she has come out with this book. And I think, uh, I think the copies are available here today, right? Huh? And uh, now let me tell you also. Indra movement was not the first mass mobilization of Indians and it's not going to be the last. Indian mobilization has been taking place even before independence. The mobilization of Krang Indians in 1941 and earlier, 1928, 1938, 1911, I can still remember when I was researching my, for my thesis on plantation level, there was a mass protest among plantation workers because the way they were treated by the British authorities. 1941, mass mobilization, not only by the Japanese independence, Jap no, sorry, Japanese League in collaboration with the Indian National Army and the Indian National League. Now, after the debacle in Imbal, and many Indians came back and they joined the forces of the left because they decided uh, India was a distant dream. It's better to fight for bread and butter in Malaya. And many joined the left. Not because they were all hardcore communists or hardcore socialists, because I think the left offered them through the GRUs an opportunity to get better wages better living standards, and so on and so forth. 1960, 1967, there was a mass mobilization of Indians from Malacca, inspired by the, the Labour Party. Hundreds of Indians walked from Asahan in Malacca to Kuala Lumpur to register the protests against uh, sacking of workers. That's very famous. Uh, in fact, my book actually details the Asahan March in 1967. 1970s and 1980s, there was sporadic protests among the Indian, Indian workers. And remember, I was working uh, uh, you know, in 1980s, there were plantation strikes and so on and so on. Come 2000, 2007, after Second World War, after the mass mobilization of Indians, a total mobilization by the INA, by Swas Andarabos, the next major pan Indian movement, or even Tamil movement, was the Hindra movement. So let's not assume the Hindra movement is going to be the final. As long as you treat minorities, marginalized communities, as long as there is this deep-seated racism in this country, I don't think Indians or any other communities are going to be happy. You look at what has happened to the, the recently, yesterday, midnight, they introduced, they passed this legislation in Parliament, the new law or law and, uh, law and reform act. Marriages and divorce. Why they need to pass the legislation? It's an empty legislation, it's an important legislation because it does not address the fundamental issue of conversion. Conversion, there is this arrogance among certain group that you can break up a marriage, you can convert, you can take custody of the children. Because the constitution says all you need is a concept of a parent. And that parent has been 
uh, defined as singular, not plural. Now, the defense of Azlina Osman, the Minister of Prime Minister's Department, and the Minister of Tourism and Culture, Nazri Aziz, or oh, this ultra biased constitution. That's all oh, like correct. That that provision in the body, that provision in the constitution is subject to the interpretations of the court. Now, what are the courts for then? Completely section 88A, which actually gives consent to both the parents, have been removed from the new law that was passed in Parliament. <coughs> and unfortunately, the non malay representatives in the Malaysian Indian Congress, MCA, I'm not sure, Gerakan. I haven't heard anything from Gerakan on this matter. They said, no, no, this matter. We go for the low hanging fruits first. <laughs> Let the legislation be passed. There are benefits of the legislation. We will go for the high hanging fruits later. I don't know whether that opportunity will ever come. This is a total sell up of the concerns of the Malaysian public, especially the non Muslims. Now, who else they can turn to? I wrote some hard pieces of this. All that is a disgraceful legislation. An important decision. Anyway, I don't want to go too far into that. <coughs> we'll return to the book in draft. And the interrupt has come up with statements from interrupt leaders. And I think she uh, I think she didn't go into that about what happened after the interrupt. Uh, some of the leaders went on their self-imposed exile and came back, and then the formation of uh, the uh, Human Rights Party, Bengali Kumar, and all these things. So I think, uh, uh, I don't think this book is very critical. And I'm trying to fill in the gaps. The most important thing is, I think, uh, Aruna might think, this focus only with all. I think if you provide the historical context, but I think the issue is, in love is an important, a significant, a far-reaching movement. It's a movement that actually raised the expectations of Indians. A movement that brought in a lot of courage and dignity to Indians. That those things cannot be erased. But then I think somewhere there is a lacuna. How do you address this Hakuna? And I don't want to go uh, further into that. I think she, I must congratulate her. It's not be easy for Aruna. Huh? She has been under tremendous pressure to get the book done, get a thesis, earlier, get a thesis done. Uh, I think she did not want to come alone to cry. She brought a mother. I know a father actually. I met a mother. Huh? So anyway, uh, uh, this is what I have to say. I think thanks for Penang Institute, Seoul, Kibbe, and many others. I think the Penang Institute is much more vibrant. I think they provide the opportunity. There is no censorship here. Uh, uh, no censorship. If there is censorship, I will resign from the board. Huh? Uh, and I think, I think Penang Knights, anybody can come and speak their mind here. Uh, even there have been occasions where they have been targeting the Penang State government also. That's all right. No? I think we can take criticisms. No? And, uh, so I think uh, that's all what I want to say. Uh, try to get a copy. I'm not a salesman. You know? <laughs> but I think so far, she's concerned. I think I have to be a salesman for a while. Huh? <laughs> Just buy the book and read it. Because I think, uh, uh, as my friend who just finished his book on the Blank Free School, I haven't read the book, but he contacted me and he wanted to ask me some Kwa, Mr. Kwa, right? Mr. Kwa. I think he has written a very heavy book. If you read the book, I think there's a lot of material in it. <laughs> a lot of stuff in it. Huh? Yeah, he just gave me the book. And I think it's a painstaking research, I can say. Huh? And I think he has done that book. I think it was the anniversary of the Black Free School, right? Uh, you have a copy here? Maybe you should, you should launch the book here. Huh? I think, maybe, we'll get the 
wants to book you on the blank dress code. A little bit of a commercial for you, Mr. Kwa. Okay, with that, I say thank you, and uh, we'll get the uh, ball rolling. Thank you.
Good afternoon, uh, distinguished members of the public. Thank you so much to YB Professor Ramasamy and staff of Penang Institute for hosting this event and book launch. Uh, when I, I was about to embark on my PhD in 2008, um, a great source of in, in, uh, inspiration was Professor Ramasamy, who was then a resident scholar of ICES. Uh, yes, I was working on Sikhs in Singapore. It was a controversial book. And then he told me, why not expand your horizons? Look at the Indian diaspora in Southeast Asia, not just in Singapore. Look at what's happening in Malaysia. Uh, why are we facing these problems in Malaysia? Why are people 50, 60 years after independence protesting for rights from the British government? What's happening? And that's exactly what I took to task in my PhD at ANU. And I had a uh, prominent scholar of the Indian diaspora, Bridge Lal, to supervise me. And he was shocked at the kind of situations and dilemmas the Indian community had been facing for the last 60 years in Malaysia. I have a prepared speech and vignettes, selected vignettes that I've taken out of the book, uh, which shows that um, Hendra had a point but not a winning case uh, from the point of independence. Uh, let me proceed. Hindra and 2007 rally was successful in capturing national and international attention over the status of the underprivileged Tamils in Malaysia. The government of India sent notice to the Malaysian government that it wished for remedies upon the situation. The British government was served a class action suit and the 2000 elections where the incumbent BN government suffered a loss of two-thirds majority was testimony of a swing of non-Malay Muslim votes to the opposition. Undoubtedly, the Hindra had a hand in this. As a scholar of the Indian diaspora resident in Singapore, I watched the occurrences of 2007 and 2008 with great interest and trepidation. I developed certain initial impressions that were useful as a starting point to begin examining the topic. Murthy's case Temple demolitions were indicative of the rise of global Islamism and this was how it was manifesting in Malaysia. The economic deprivation of the Indian community, lack of citizenship papers, police atrocities upon Indian inmates in my mind justified William Case's thesis of the contemporary authoritarianism in Southeast Asia. However, the plight of the Tamil Indians in Malaysia was not an anomaly when it came to communities of the old Indian diaspora scattered around the globe due to British colonial expansion and intra-empire migration. At the point of Indian independence in 1947, several communities of the Indian diaspora felt confusion and fracture in identity. For the most part, Indians became the internal problem of host countries' indigenous governments that did not grant them equal rights. Burma's and Indochina's nationalization policies led Indian businessmen, particularly the Chatya community, to lose vast amounts of property. Sri Lanka refused to give Tamil citizenship, arguing they were birds of passage and a transient population. Kenyan Indians faced the process of Africanization, feared deportation, which became a reality for the Indians in Uganda when Idi Amin in 1972 ordered the expulsion of aliens of Asian origin in 90 days. It was a case of displacement of people and identities. Throughout the colonial migratory and settlement period, the old diaspora had demonstrated a psychological unity in orientation towards British India and subsequently the Indian independence struggle identified with Nehru and Gandhi. And upon independence in 1947, the old Indian diaspora was told to associate with the host country colony and their respective nationalisms if they did not choose Indian citizenship. Nehru wished that we do not like any country to ill-treat Indian nationals. They should be given all the rights of citizenship. Indians' connection will be cultural and not political. But he also advised that overseas Indians should completely associate themselves with the indigenous people of the country to give primary consideration to the interests of the original inhabitants and not to develop vested interests, not to demand any special rights and privileges, and to extend the undivided loyalty to the country of their residents. Nehru's wishes did not create ideal situations for the old Indian diaspora. 
In the case of Malaya and many other countries, Indians lost in the game of loyalty as they were seen as transient and enamored with Congress ideology and symbolism. And they lost out being minorities not always affluent in the inability to demand for special rights in not having reservations or even a voice in schools, legislatures and the government service of host countries, thus, thus compromising their future rights. This book, Hindra and the Malaysian Indians, attempts to look for answers as to the reasons for the plight of the Tamil Indian in Malaysia half a century on from independence. It asks the following, where was the voice of resistance against oppressive masters and conditions in the plantations during the colonial era. At the point of decolonization, how did the Indian community negotiate their rights as citizens to be of Malaya or Malaysia? What was their nation of intent? As part of the consocialism model of power sharing with the BN, what space did the Malaysian Indian Congress have in negotiating a better life for Indians? What were the political spaces besides the MIC that could act on behalf of the underprivileged Indians? However, for today's talk, I wish to concentrate on Hindra's move to sue the British government for the plight of Indian Tamils in Malaysia. Through the class action suit, it was obvious that Hindra was navel gazing. Why? How? And for what were non Malays in a social contract that favoured the Malay position? The United Malay National Organization, AMNO, was not formed to release Malaya from the yoke of British imperialism as much as to ensure and protect Malay's special privileges and rights. Anthony Reid, in expressing the dilemmas of Southeast Asian nationalisms, acknowledges that countries in these regions attempt to foster nationalisms that are essentially built around a core, usually an ethnic core, with a civic path encapsulated by a territory as instituted by colonial authorities. In the case of Malaysia, its, cultural, its core culture is a Malayness which predominates in the Malaysian national consciousness. This has two implications. That Malaysian national consciousness is a fragmented one with Malays as the core and the other communities on the periphery, each beholding their own nation of intent, intent for Malaysia. That Malaysian national consciousness is not one which promises inclusivity. It has exclusive rights for the sons of the soil, Gobi Patras, versus migrant communities, Pandata, essentially in reference to the Chinese and the Indians. Through the latter, communities have been settled on Malaysian soil for generations and centuries. This raises the question so often asked in migration literature, which addresses issues of belonging, assimilation, continuities, and disjuncture from the original land of migration. In the case of Malaysian Indians, they no longer have family in India. They have no interest or stake in Indian national or Tamil Nadu politics except for general knowledge. And most exercise cultural affiliation with India through religious practice and customs as handed down from their ancestors. Visiting Indian nationals from the subcontinent claim that they do not practice the religion or culture or speak the language the way Malaysian Indians do. In short, Malaysia is the only home Malaysian Indians have yet they are considered a foreign and with a secondary state in the national consciousness of Malaysia. But, was there space for negotiation for equal rights for Indians, along with the Chinese as power handed down or over from the British government? And the answer is yes, there was. There was this moment in time called the Malayan Union Proposal. In 1945, when colonial re rule resumed after the war, the colonial masters were faced with the awareness that circumstances had altered notions of location and belonging amongst ethnic communities previously considered of migrant mentalities. Inter-ethnic relations as well as notions of loyalty, acquiescence to colonial rule. As with other colonies, the British were returning to meet expectations of political reform and eventual self-government. In the case of Malaya, they felt obliged to acknowledge the contributions of migrant communities who had played a pivotal role in developing the economy of the country, especially the Chinese who had endured tremendous suffering during the Japanese occupation and had assisted war efforts through resistance movement, movements such as the Malayan People's Anti-Japanese Army. Further, there were undertones implying that the British were piqued about the alleged collaboration between Malay rulers with the Japanese and the involvement of Malays in fifth column activities. The Malayan Union 
Union proposal was put forth, it was not a reversal of Malay privileges that the British were seeking. Rather, they were interested in instituting a Westminster-style parliamentary system to foster a constitutional unity in Malaya, which would have eventually required an electorate with equal rights. Aware of the separateness of the Malays, Chinese and Indians, and with the development of their respective disparate nationalisms, Admiral Lord Mountbatten wanted to break down racial sectionalism in every way open to us, politically, economically and socially, and to endeavour to substitute for it the idea of Malayan citizenship by getting Malays, Chinese or Indians to combine together to deal as citizens, and not as racial communities with the local problems of Malaya in the same light. Yet the British were also aware that this would be problematic as endeavouring to admit non-Malay communities to a political equality with the Malays in the state territories. The success of the Malayan Union was trolled by the contest of nationalisms. By 1945, the Malay community had already developed a sophisticated machinery of thought and mobilisation of Malay concept of nation, unity and belonging vis-à-vis -vis the Indian community. At this juncture, I'd like to point out a vignette of the confusion of citizenship and nationality the Indians of Malaya were to encounter that presented an image to colonial masters and the Malay community a sense that they were essentially birds of passage. Indians in Malaya demonstrated indecision over where they belonged in the decolonization movement. Indian businesses, after witnessing the nationalization of properties and businesses in former colonies such as Ceylon, Burma and Indochina feared the confiscation of their property and began to relocate their money to India. The Straits Times reported in 1951 that Indian businessmen in Malaya were selling out and transferring much of their wealth to India. The rate of transfer was 29 million a year amounting to a total flight of capital of 606 million. The Indian government also facilitated this movement of investments by relaxing taxation of remittances and the prospects of India's upcoming plans to industrialize proved attractive for overseas Indian investments. The local Malayan press portrayed this as a sellout on the part of the Indian community towards Malaya. In 1953, Malay leaders expressed concern that thousands of Indians were coming into Malaya to beat the deadline of an immigration bill that was to restrict the inflow of immigrants. Dr. On bin Jaffa highlighted that ships were steaming to and from India non-stop in an effort to bring in thousands of immigrants. Other Malay leaders expressed alarm that Malaya was still considered a land of milk and honey, which would attract more of the working class from India and depress further already stores, low standards of living, wages and hours. The Indian educated elite of Malaya tried to make sense of the processes of citizenship that were being offered to the Malayan Indian community. Due to Malay opposition to the Malayan Union proposals of 1946, which, have not, which would have nullified the sovereignty of the sultans of the various Malay states and transferred full power and jurisdiction to Britain, as well as accruing more equitable citizenship rights to non-Malays, the British offered federal citizenship by application in 1948 to non-Malays. This required that you had to be born in certain territories, you had to have you had to be resident 8 out of 12 years in Malaya, as well as be proficient with in Malaya in Malay or English language. The government still remained in the hands of the High Commissioner, who was a representative of the British government. Thus, while Malay nationality and belonging was safeguarded under the jurisdiction of the respective sultans, the citizenship offered to non-Malays was restricted to political participation rather than nationality. This created much apprehension and confusion in the minds of the Indian elite in envisioning the sense of peoplehood for the Indian community in Malaya. Indian leaders exhorted Indians in Malaya to maintain a primary allegiance to Malaya and to stop giving the impression to the local Malay leaders they were transients. At a ceremony at the Ramakrishna Mission orphanage, John Tevi said that Indians must stop the bird of passage attitude. Indians must give something to Malaya for posterity, something to remember Indians by. In this country, Indians must not only think of earning a living and take back as much as they can, but contribute and give generously for the social service. On another occasion, other leaders explained the obligation and position of the role of local born Indians. Nevertheless, the Indian leaders themselves were confused in terms of instilling a sense of Malayan Indian community when presented with the fact that they had a Malayan federal citizenship without a nationality. A certain prominent figure at that time, R. Ramani, explained the situation thus, I quote, Citizenship is like a coat. 
but nationality is in our bones. The citizenship that is offered to us in Malaya is something that is not coextensive with nationality. Citizenship is a quality that a person acquires by being in residence in a particular country for a particular number of years. Whereas nationality is an attribute which is born in him, which is part of his blood and bones by reason of the fact that either he is born in the soil of his country or born elsewhere of parents who are born in the home country. There are no nationals of Malaya. One can only be subject of the ruler of a state by birth or naturalization. When you begin to discuss the question of rights of a particular person in Malaya and call him in certain events a federal citizen, it is like to confuse constitutional pundits and this is a new concept of nationality introduced in Malaya. So there were several such junctures of community dilemmas from the point of the decolonization. What were the Indian leaders doing at the point of NEP, new economic policy, in the 1970s? There was a contestation of power between P.T. Sampatan and Malika Savagam. What happened in the years of Sami Velu? So much time, so much effort, so much chance. Where did it all go? So this is what the book speaks about, the key points of history, Malaysian history. What did the Indian leaders do for themselves? What did the Indian leaders do for the community? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Moos. And uh, greetings to Dr. Varuna. And uh, good evening to our distinguished guest here. I'm supposed to be a discussion or explain you know, in detail something about the book. And I don't intend to criticize huh, Dr. Aruna or anybody, but I'm trying to, you know, not to say explain, just say whatever, you know, I uh, say in the book. This study, that's a book by Dr. Aruna, is an analysis about the civic space. You see, the, the focus is about the civic space. Either enjoyed or did not enjoy. Either available or not available. For the Indians in this country as a minority group, they negotiate with the government to defend their rights and to safeguard you know, their interests politically, economically and socially. So that is what actually the book is focused on to analyze whether there was such a space available or not. You see, the author has done quite an extensive research. We should commend her for that. Because doing research in history, and more especially about Indians, is not that easy. One reason is that the not availability of documents it's a very unfortunate thing, you know, even when I did my research, I know about it. It's not easy to get documents where the NGOs or political parties or wherever it is. So long as these people are there, they will maintain that. The moment they leave and somebody comes back, they carry along all the documents with them. <laughs> and I tried to, you know, chase some of these leaders and unfortunately they were not that cooperative. So, it's actually a quite a difficult task. Not much is available in our national archives also. Well, since the author has already you know, gone through the available literature, and the author has made some uh, conclusions, whereby he says that most of the work, most of the work that has been done in the past, analyzing the marginalization of Indians, have actually made some generalization when they try to explain why the reasons for this myelization, according to Dr. Aruna, it has been generalized like the existence of a privileged group, there's a Malays. So that's one of the reasons. It seems there is a you know, privileged group. So naturally, the Indians got marginalized and the inherent divisions within the Indians, which everybody knows, and the ineffective leadership among Indians. So according to the author, this is what 
most of the scholars, almost all the scholars, you know, put forth as the reason for the marginalization of the Indians in this country. When I say Indians here, yeah, Dr. Aruna you know, specified that means Tamils, since Tamils make 80 or more than 80 percent of the Indian population here. So generally, though we say Indian, the focus is on Tamils. And then the reason for this generalization, this simplistic view, according to the author, is most of the scholars have failed to give emphasis or account for the most defining moments in the political and economic and social history of Indians. What are the defining moments? According to her, they made 13, 1969 clashes where according to the author, the reactions and response of the Indians had not been accounted. There was no analysis on the response and reactions of the Indians on that particular incident. I don't know whether the documents for that is available in this country. As far as I know, all these have been classified and will remain classified forever. Where we should go to Australia, where it has been already been declassified. And the formation of NOC, which actually decided the fate of this country soon after its being the NOC under Pundrasa, they decided everything. It was the NOC actually, the idea of NOC, you know, whereby mm -hmm. any people was formulated. 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 Any people was formulated. What were the Indian leaders doing during this period? That's a question he is facing. What were they doing? And the increasing predecessors of authoritarianism and patronage during the Mahathirin era. All of us know we have lived through that ages of more, more than two decades. What is the role played by the Indian leaders? And the increasing Islamization of Malaysia. So the author says, these were the, were the defining moments in the Malaysian history, and unfortunately, nothing much has been investigated. These defining moments has not been uh, have not been analyzed to find out what the Indians or the Indian leaders were doing, and uh, because of that, according to her, always you know simple reasons about the privileged group, about the ineffective leadership, the inner and a division within the community has always been given. I too have done that and most people have done that and we know that is also the reasons for the marginalization of Indians. Well now, what the author intend to do or has already done in the book to find out if there was the political space for the Indians to negotiate the rights during the decolonization period. Are there a political space or not? Were, we, were the Indians given space to negotiate? And what kind of bargain? What kind of bargain was put forth by the Indian community leaders during this decolonization? Not only, not, not only during the decolonization period, but more importantly, because the emphasis of uh, Dr. Arana is on 70 onwards because much has been done according to her, you know, the decolonization period. So, as I said, you know, the defining moments, May 30 and afterwards. So, what were the bargains put forth by the community leaders during the formulation of the Did they put in any, you know, bargain was there? Or they were just in a such series. And how effective was MIC in negotiating the rights of the Indians in that community? Whether we like it or not, we have to talk about MIC because MIC has been in a part and parcel of the Indian history in this country from 46 onwards until now. So it's not, you know, the, author, the author is not trying to you know, criticize or to say anything bad about MIC, but trying to you know, investigate, trying to find out, trying to you know, analyze. The role, how effective was the MIC? 
during these defining moments. And was there space? That is where we grab. Was there space for others, other than MIC, to play a role as negotiator with the government? So these are the objectives to analyze on the defining moments. And uh, this is the author, you know, has done so much you know, uh, research and arranged that in uh, six chapters beside the introduction and uh, conclusion. There are six main chapters. So I'll give the gist of you know, all this, each of these six chapters, the summary of it. The first chapter actually gives the setting, the background of the early Tamil laborers, the position you know, they were. And according to the author, during this time, Seems you know this Indian labor was stuck in a complex subsystem. The space for negotiation practically did not exist. That's a fact. There was no space for negotiation at all during the early period. That is the reason, you know, they will run away from the estates. They will march to KL. But they would not be able to you know, negotiate. Those days, you know, union was not existed yet. And these people were not educated. So it's more like a kind of a modern day slavery. And the chap but but even these people, you know, got an opportunity during the Japanese occupation, more especially when they joined IND. They were given training. They got motivations. They were in the camps. Estate laborers. <coughs> and actually that made them a little bit bold. They were brave. They have learned you know, how to organize themselves in <coughs> associations. And that is one of the reasons why later, you know, soon after the war when the British returned, these Indians managed to organize themselves into unions, trade unions, the GLUs. <coughs> of course, you know, the force behind GLU was the Communist Party. The Communist Party, you know, inspired them. And uh, according to some reports, you know, they were trying to make use of it. So we don't go into it. But the main fact here is that Japanese occupation has given them, you know, some kind of uh, that experience, you know, made them bold. They have learned, you know, how to organize themselves into unions and bravely questioned the British. They organized strikes all over the places, but unfortunately, all this came into a sudden death because of the declaration of emergency in 1948. And the British used that as an excuse with the reckoning laws, you know. They managed to bring these people back to the state you know, during it, before the uh, war. So everything is gone. You know. And the second stage started during the decolonization period, soon after the you know, soon after the British came. And they wanted to implement that the Malay Union, whereby MIC was formed in 1946. You must understand MIC was formed in the same year with AMNO, but unfortunately, AMNO has grown, you know, to such a and as a giant, but MIC remains the same. And during that decolonization period, there is an MIC, but you must also understand that during that period, MIC was very much aggressive under John TV and even under Bootsy. Very aggressive. They were always, you know, confrontation. So much so, the British refused to 
and recognize MIC as an representative. So during the decolonization period, British has given so much of you know, recognition to the Chinese through MCA. When CSC was formed, the Community Liaison Committee, seven Malays and five Chinese were appointed to the committee. Not a single Indian was appointed. Because the Indian was not at all recognized by the British. That is where the argument is. Was there space existed? Was there space available? With which the Indian can negotiate. Even Amno refused to you know, accept MIC. When John TV several times called Amno, even criticized Amno. Telling them not to hide behind a coconut shell and come out. No. Nobody wanted to recognize MIC, nobody had recognized the Indians. So, practically, again, even during the decolonization period, I'm not too sure whether a space existed for them, the civic space, with which they can negotiate. And the third and the fourth chapter is about the post colonial period or the, the main uh, gist of the Arunas, you know, the NEP and all these things. And this is supposed to be the most crucial period of Malaysian history. And what's happening today is actually was decided in 1970 and 71, where the new economic policy was decided. And again, the question arises here. Was there a space available? If at all there was a space, what was the bargain put by our leaders there? The unfortunate thing is that while UMNO and MCA they were working as a unit, as a community, putting aside all their differences, and try, try, you know, try to get as much as possible for them under this under, under this uh, in a LEP. MIC during the first phase that was under Samantha and uh, and Monica, and later under Samir, there was infighting. They continue to fight and fight and fight and fight. And they continue fighting until today. <laughs> so there was no time for them you know, to negotiate with the government for the benefit of their community. So with all these things gone, the people were really fed up. The people, the Indians, they also don't know what exactly to do. And just at that moment came this alternative voice that is Indra. And Indra's history, I think most of you know how it came about. It's because of, you know, one thing, the Indra itself is Hindu, right, actually false. So the aspect Hindu is there. It's partly because of the demolition of temples all over the places. And uh, the conversion, the conversion of Hindus, more especially the, what's his name, was it? The name of the person who went down? Murti. Murti, yes, Murti. The average time. Without the knowledge of his family, his wife, when he was suffering, nobody came for therapy. But when he died, his body was snatched away, claiming that you know, he was a Muslim. That is one of the reasons why Indra came out. It's actually a coalition of so many you know, NGOs. And Indra, you know, from 2006 onwards, you know, they have been trying to negotiate with the government. You see, that is very important. They wrote a letter to the Prime Minister. 
explaining, you know, the injustice being perpetrated against the Indians, the Hindus. Then they wrote to the law minister, at the last week that time, they wrote to the attorney general, they wrote again to the prime minister, they sent a letter to the Sultan of Islam expressing, you know, how shall I put it, you know, they were so frightened because within, within about two, two and a half months, more than 11 temples had been demolished. And there was a schedule for another, so many other temples, you know, within the next few weeks, you know, going to be demolished. They wrote to the Sultan of Islam asking the interview. When none of this there was no response at all, completely no response at all. Because the government refused to accept any others other than MIC to negotiate. And unfortunately, MIC was not a negotiator. And what actually happened? They wrote to Kotlana. And then they wrote, they, they, they you know, said they want to have, uh, you know, they, they actually want to present a memo to the ambassador seeking, you know, the Queen's support to, have, to get, you know, the Queen's counsel to fight for the case. Actually, you see that the motive behind here is to internationalize the issue and also at the same time to embarrass them. But even then, there was no response, there was no answer. The government did not invite these people to sit and talk. But because they did not acknowledge Indra or any others other than MIC. And MIC was backing Indra like a criticizing. criticizing. So when they took to the streets, On November 25th, the full force of the government they came along. It was even worse than what the British did. So the people were arrested, some of them were charged with murder. Even you know, after all these things, the government refused to allow any others other than MIC to negotiate with them. So finally what happened? According to author, she concludes that right from beginning, the civil space was so small and it kept on shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. And now we wonder whether they exist because from what's happening today, the Law Reform Act. It's obvious that there's no negotiation at all. It's very obvious. There's no space at all for the Indians to negotiate. So crumbs are thrown at you, you just pick it up. If you are not happy, just keep quiet. Don't make noise. Don't take to the streets. So that is what Dr. Aruna has written. But I have just, you know, one comment here. Or oh, two things I would say. In the first place, you know, Dr. Aruna says most scholars have generalized, you know, things or simplified it. But even in this book, or even in you know, whatever books you read, we cannot run away from the initial facts that privileged group. Because the existence of privileged group like that, the rights of the others are being. And the ineffective leadership and the inherent divisions within the Indians. All these are being emphasized also here in chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, and therefore. And the last chapter is about Indra. When I look at the name, you know, Indra and the Indian community, I thought the book is going to be about Indra. But it is not so. 
there is only one chapter, one of the three chapters, and only about 33 pages out of the 303 pages. So I am not too sure where the author should be able to justify. Is it all right to call this book as Indra in the Indian? It is rather a kind of, you know, political negotiation of the availability of the civic space. Well, that kind of, you know, topic, what I think would have been much more appropriate. Or the author might have a reason for putting Indra out there. Because I say, you know, I just want to check that there's no too little about Indra. Because whoever sees the title, the assumption will be, you know, the book is about Indra, how Indra came about, and the entire thing, at least, you know, about 50 or 60 percent of the book should be about Indra. But that is not the case. It's only about 10 percent of the book is about Indra. So I leave it to the author, you know. Somebody else not that strong. Other than that, the book is a contribution to the existing literature on Indians. It has, you know, touched on you know several aspects like you know the not only the decolonized period but the period after that and came up to until the Indra. Perhaps no others have written you know anything about Indra so far. I mean, a scholarly book, not writing on you know papers or in the you know. In that sense, you know, thank you very much for adding to the existing agriculture.